I recently did an edge retention comparison on a few knives. K-Bar, SE, Spyderco. These are three similar knives in that they're not geared toward really low stress cutting. Relatively thick blade stock, especially for the shorter blades. So they have a fair bit of design into the scope for you know prying type work or heavier cutting where you're doing sort of twisting and poking you don't make a blade that thick for cutting paper and soft foods now the knives were kept very close to their as box configuration so the edge thickness and the edge angle was very similar to the actual new knives I didn't change it now it's important to realize that when you do comparisons like that you're no longer looking at just the steel alone because these other changes between the knives will influence the edge retention just as much or in some cases even more than the steel but often that type of comparison is of interest because a practical question for a lot of people is well if I just bought this knife and I just bought this knife and I didn't do some kind of equalization where I made everything the same, what would the edge retention ratio actually look like? Because a lot of people are interested in the whole picture, not just the performance of the steel. So when I looked at the edge retention of these three knives, the SE and the K-Bar were very similar, which you would expect because the steels are very similar, 1095, 1095CV, and the profiles, the grinds, were relatively similar in terms of edge angle and edge thickness. The K-Bar was a little bit heavier in terms of the blade grind and the thickness of the edge. And that slightly lowered the performance. Not enough to say that there was a statistical difference between the two, but if I did more repeated runs, I'd probably see the SA pull ahead a little bit. Spyderco, on the other hand, was significantly ahead. Now, it had an advantage from a wide number of aspects. The edge angle was lower, the edge thickness was lower, the blade grind was deeper, the steel is likely one or two Rockwell points harder, and it has a small amount of chromium carbides. And all of these little effects added up and produced a significant edge retention advantage for slicing relatively clean cardboard or these other two knives. Now, that doesn't mean that this knife is in general better at edge retention over everything. For harder work, the greater toughness and durability of these two knives may actually make them have better edge retention in some other work. In a recent challenge video, I put up the graph showing the performance of these three knives. And then I asked, well, what would happen if I use this? This is an AK-47 from Cold Steel that I've heavily modified to make the handle much more comfortable. Because when I got it, it hotspotted a lot. Now, rounded out this, rounded out that, rounded out that, rounded out the clip. Nice, comfortable, and secure grip. The other thing that I did was I dramatically reduced the edge angle. It's around 10 degrees per side now, which is significantly lower than even the spider cone. Note that it has a similar grind to the Spyderco. They're both hollow grinds, but the AK-47 is slightly higher and significantly deeper. So the blade right here is thinner on the AK-47 than the Spyderco Vagabond. So it has an advantage in that the steel is again likely one or two Rockwell points harder than this. It has a significant more amount of chromium carbides than this. The edge angle is significantly smaller by about 50%. And it has a deeper blade bevel and a higher blade bevel. So what would you expect from the result of all of those added up? The results were somewhat split. Most people agree that it would be higher. Few people thought that the angle would be so low that it actually could reduce the edge retention. That can happen, 
but generally it takes a lot lower than 10 degrees per side. You need to be somewhere around 4 to 6 degrees per side before the edge bevel will crack off in cutting cardboard. I'm now going to put up the results and it might surprise quite a lot of people. No one expected that the edge retention advantage would be anywhere near that large. Why it actually happens is a sort of trick or way that percentages actually work. When you have something that increases by multiple effects and they're all percentages, they don't just add up. For example, if you have two 50% effects that happen at the same time, what's the total effect? It's not 50% plus 50%, which is 100%, which is what most people think happens. The reason why that doesn't work is that the second 50% increases not only the original number, but the part that was increased by the first 50%. So say if you start off with 1 and you increase by 50%, you get 1.5. Now when you take the second 50%, it doesn't just increase the original number 1, it increases the 1.5. So that extra 0.5 from the first 50% gets increased as well by the next 50%. When you think about the AK-47, you see there's a whole number of percents that are happening. You get a percentage increase from the edge angle being reduced, which actually happens twice. Then you get a percentage increase because of the hardness, then you get a percentage increase because of the carbide volume, then you get a percentage increase because the blade grind is slightly higher, then you get a percentage increase because the blade grind is slightly deeper. And all of these percentage increases don't just add to the original performance, they keep adding to the performances from the percentage before them. So it keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. So the total effect of them is much higher than just the percentages added together because they all increase from the increases from each other. Now, how come increasing or decreasing the edge bevel has sort of the effect applied twice? So the edge angle on this decreased by about 50%. But that actually influences performance in two different ways. The first way it influences the performance is basically very direct. And it's what most people think happens. So say you start off with a wedge like this. Very, very large angle, abrupt wedge. And you imagine this going through the cardboard. Well, the cardboard is cut by the very tip of the wedge, this part up here. The cardboard then smashes in through the sides of the wedge, which sort of push the cardboard abruptly out of the way. As it pushes the cardboard out of the way, it makes the cardboard deform and get squashed, which makes the cardboard actually harder to cut. And it increases the forces around the very apex. So the more abrupt the angle, the more force it actually makes the apex have to deal with as it's cutting through the cardboard. That's the first effect. But it also does something which is a bit more subtle. Think about this very abrupt, very, very large angle edge grind. Now think about putting a small apex or micro bevel on this. So what you're going to do now is come in and put another grind right here. Think about that versus a much smaller angle. You can see the much smaller angle has far less steel up around the apex. This. See how much steel there is up around the apex compared to this, very little steel up around the apex. So when you apply that micro bevel up around the apex, because it has a much smaller amount of steel, the actual level of the roughness or teeth in the actual apex will increase at a given grit finish. So when you make an edge very, very small, the edge angle, it actually makes the stone act like it's more coarse. And coarser finishes will increase edge retention in slicing or draw cuts. 
So if you look at what you would expect, just doing very basic, say, approximations, you'd expect a 50% increase in performance because the edge angle went down and that decreases the force. You expect another 50% increase in performance because the edge roughness or tooth depth increased. The hardness changed by about say one to two points somewhere around say five percent. Normally if you double the hardness you get a decent approximation again we're just talking very roughly here as to how much the strength increases. So there's probably a ten percent increase in strength. Carbide volume you can actually get if you actually look at the phase diagrams that I put up and look at the difference in position from the composition of AUS8 versus AUS6 compared to the carbon saturation line and you can estimate the carbide volume change. Very difficult because you don't know how these were heat treated and that actually moves around the carbon saturation line but again as a coarse estimate somewhere between 25 to 50 percent more carbide in this. So you got three fifty percent already and one ten percent. Now you have to look at the blade bevel is significantly higher and the blade bevel is significantly deeper. Say so throw on another couple of ten percent for that. And now multiply all them out and you'll see that you would expect a very large increase in performance from this over the Vagabond. Now again, these are course estimates. The actual model that predicates the performance is not linear in all these attributes. But for first order, when you're just making a course approximation, if you assume everything is linear, you can start off with a number actually. That can work. And again, just keep in mind, it's a very course approximation but it'll tell you at least the sort of size of the number that you're actually looking at. So hope this was of interest and the main point that I was trying to make here is that when you're looking at performances between knives the actual geometry of the knife tends to make a lot more difference than the actual steel. The performance characteristics of the steels, even if you go from steels completely on one end to say the 420 type stainless steels, to you go all the way up on the other end of say the 10V type steels, the range in performance due to the steels alone is only about 2 to 1. On the extreme end from one side to the other, only about 2 to 1. And you can see this if you look at, for example, uh, catcher scores of the entire steels from one side to the other or you look at the actual material properties say you look at the strength of the steels from one side to the other however the geometrical differences can change much more than two to one especially because many of them can change at the same time think about the influence of grit alone you can put an edge on this with a hundred grit or you can put an edge on it with a thousand grit. That's a ten times change in grit. You can sharpen this with ten degrees per side or you can sharpen it at thirty degrees per side. That's a three times change in edge angle. And like I said, edge angle actually hits you twice. So it hits you three times, then it hits you three times again. So that's three times three, which is nine, which is almost another ten times change in performance. The thickness of the edge, many so-called high-performance cutting production knives come with an edge thickness of around 25 to 30 thousandths. There are lots of knives where the edge thickness is less than 5 thousandths. That's a change of 5 to 1. So when you start looking at it, when you have a change of 5 to 1 in the edge thickness, when you have a change of 3 to 1 in terms of the edge angle, when you have a change of 10 to 1 in terms of the grit finish, all of these changes add up. So it's a huge change. It's much more than a 100 to 1 times change when you look at these types of influence versus the very tiny 2 to 1 change that you get in steels. 
just something to think about.